Hey, welcome everybody. Glad to have Steve back here with us this week, and we're glad that you're here as well, watching, hanging out with us. Now, before we get going, before we do anything else, the question that I want to ask everyone today, and go ahead and share, um, say hello, where you're watching from, and how many years you have been working or enjoying, working with or enjoying the mule or the donkey. And so, uh, Steve, it's good to have you back here. How was Wyoming? Oh, it was absolutely incredible. Uh, <laughs> Joel up there is it, uh, he's quite a hunter and he's got mules. And I have never harvested three turkeys in one hunt. And I harvested three turkeys. I mean, we're going to be eating turkey breasts for quite a while. It's going to be pretty yummy. Uh, we, uh, I, I harvested them all three at one time, one with the archery and two with the firearms. But with that day, we, it was 60 degrees. The next day in Gillette, Wyoming, ha, 23 degrees and snowing and the wind and the snow was going horizontal. It was not going down. Wow. So I was glad I harvested my turkeys and I got back here to good old sunny Arizona. It's 93 degrees here right now. But guess what? Ha, tomorrow morning, I'm flying out to Minnesota cold. Yep. Minneapolis. I'm coming to see all of my Minneapolis. And Minnesota, folks, 63 degrees is going to be an average over there. That's My goodness. Great. I was yeah. in Minnesota in the fall. I love Minneapolis. It was so much fun. That was my first time being, and it was fantastic. Oh, awesome. So you're going awesome. to you're gonna enjoy it there. Yeah, we saw the video. For those of you who weren't with us last week, uh, we kept rolling on. So even though Steve wasn't here, he's given us lots of good stuff that we've recorded over the last several months. And I put together a kind of like a greatest hits with some special footage in there from some of the clinics. Uh, but we did play the video that you sent in of Wyoming with that snow falling down. That was pretty cool. And I showed them pictures of the uh, of the turkeys that that you harvested, too. So that was fun. We had a really good time, but we are definitely glad that you're back. And I'm sure you're glad to be back, too. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, you bet. I'm, it's uh, it's nice to go in and visit and stuff, but you know how it is sleeping in another bed and yeah. and this sort of thing is kind of unique. And you know, I had my wife; she held things together for me while I was here. That's boy, I've been married 50 years coming up July 10th, and that's it was awesome. awesome. Yeah, that's thank awesome. You. Well, we've got several people here hanging out with us already. We've got Eileen. And uh, Eileen, yes, we are going to get to the Spurs question. We have uh, Tracy Foley. We've got Jana Schmidt. We've, yep, there's the Spurs right there. We got Gloria and uh, Rex Meyer from Arcanum, Ohio. Hi, Gloria. Good to see you. Gloria, that's three. Uh, Yolanda from Pol uh, Yolanda from the Yolanda Poland from the Netherlands is back with us again. She's giving wow. waves. Yes. Let's see. Uh, Eric Palmer says, Steve, did you go for a dog sled ride with Joel? <laughs> I, I wish I could have. Uh... Uh, but the weather was just absolutely pathetic, uh, horizontal. But his wife, she's the, the teamster. But one of these days, I'm going to go up there and do that. I've seen all these awesome pictures. And and to run sled dogs has to be just a hoot, man. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Linda Kramer says, hey there, Steve. Uh, Debbie Olson. Uh, Steve, Debbie from North Dakota. She's watching. Kara Linder Whitehead. Uh, Eileen, yep, she's here. So let's get going. The first thing that I want to get in, and folks, don't forget to put in there, how many years have you been working with or enjoying these mules and donkeys? Go ahead, put that in there. Let's let's <coughs> see how everyone's doing. If it's one year, awesome. If, it, if you're brand new and it's just a month, even better. And if you've been working with them for decades or four decades like Steve here, uh, that would be fantastic as well. Would love to hear from you. So the first question is going to be a tack on from uh, two weeks ago. Eileen sent in a quote or a question basically saying, what should we be using for spurs? And you had said, you know, it's kind of hard to talk about it with not, without actually having them here. So today you've got the spurs. So why don't we just go ahead and make this a spurs 101? What do we need to know about spurs? What do we need to know about using them, their function, the proper way to use them, and then the different kinds? You want to go ahead and just educate us, Steve? You betcha. Here, here's the thing with the spur. It refines your communication. And it also helps you with the communication of asking, telling, demanding. So we're going to ask with our calf. Now, our legs are alongside of our animals. And uh, and we're going to ask with our calf. 
tail with the side of our stirrup, the man with the spur. Now, that is only when we don't get the result that we want, all right? Now, I can I can be really refining with my spur and just barely touch a spot to make it give even quicker. So it doesn't have to be a part of asking, telling, demanding. If I would really like to have a really pretty side pass and be really quick, then my spur would be my accelerator. Now, here's what we don't want to do. Remember the part of asking with the calf. What happens is sometimes we can have a big, fat mule, right? And so we want to ask them to do something, and the spur is not long enough from the side of the animal to where, to from the side of the animal. So we can come around here. When I bring my spur and have it come around, I want it to touch right now. If we have to move our leg in to be able to get the communication, that means I'm double communicating both with the calf and my spur. And that's not what we want. The calf is a asking stage. The demanding is the spur. Or let's go back. If I want to really refine my touch with the spur only, then that's different. But here's the problem. When we use too small of a shank, and this is the shank right here. When we use too small of a shank, we end up pushing too much with our calf to get the spur to get there. So the spur length means a lot as far as the shank goes. And you can see this spur here. It's a custom made. You can see the mule head on it right there. Mm -hmm. That's and cool. it's all it's all it's made by one of the top metal, metal top ten metal urges metallurgist in the world and he's right here in uh in scottsdale his name's tim hancock it's a custom made spur now when when tim and i was doing some trading let me just give you a little background on this uh i was doing some training with him showing him how to do things and train on his mule and we traded for these spurs and when i got him he said steve says get them spurs insured and I said, really? Well, how, why is that? He says, because if I had to put a worth on these handmade spurs with the mule head to be around 3500 bucks. Wow. Yeah. So it's it's kind of like owning art at the same time. But the spur is going to depend on what you're going to do. Now, sometimes this spur head may come up and move over. And that's called a lady leg spur. And that is when... Your leg is higher or lower than the uh, than the body. So here's your leg here. If you're trying to hit the body and you're going underneath it, you're not doing any good. But the lady leg actually comes up so that you're able to touch. So there's a variety of different spurs. And it's going to depend on your mule and you. Now, notice on the back of this boot here. You see that spur heel, that notch? Yep. That's important because... That keeps the spur from going downhill, from going over top like this. So, and you want your spur to be heavy so that it hangs. Listen. You hear that? Mm hmm. Now, if I just shake my spur when I first get on, if I even just shake it like this, and that mule hears that, he automatically knows he better be on power steering. Now, I don't harpoon him. OK, uh, I, I really want to stay a refined touch. So if I harpoon them, that means I could get on a fight and they don't like that punch. So if I harpoon them, it's because they're saying I ain't going to do it. And they put me on ignore, you know. But folks, if you're going to use spurs, do your work on the ground first. First with a whip from a distance away and just touch them. Let them get used to. Your, your touch in four places. Uh, and, and remember, your communication is going to be asking, telling, demanding. So you say so touch in, in four places. What are those four places? <clears throat> well, all right. Let's say I want to side pass. Yeah. So here's my body here, my legs here. When I side pass, I'm going to touch in the middle. Mm -hmm. When I'm going to 
turn on the hindquarters, my spur is going to move four inches forward and move the shoulder over. Okay. If then we go back to the center. If I want to move the back end over, my spur goes over to here and touches and moves the back end over. Mm -hmm. So it's side passing. Turn on the forehand. I mean, turn on the hind quarters. Turn on the forehand. So, and then the the fourth the fourth place is if for some reason or another they that's moving forward. So when I do that, that's going to be right left. I never want to use both of my legs at the same time. I want to ask with my right side, left side. Okay, so that's forward motion. <coughs> so side pass. Right in the center, turn on the on the hind quarters, so I touch here and the back end stays in place. Turn on the forehand, I touch back here, and I turn on the, the front end. So basically my legs look like this. This one right here, side pass. Yeah. <coughs> Got it? Yep. Side pass and then turn on the hind quarters and turn on the forehand and then mm -hmm. forward motion. Very good. So you said one thing that um, you, you kind of hinted at one thing that I want to ask as a follow up. You said, you know, if you're going to use spurs, make sure you have your ground uh, training, your ground uh, foundation training done. So is it one of those deals where if I if I've done a good job with my ground training foundation, am I going to even need spurs if they're going to listen to that rope? Do I do I want to have them or am I not going to need to use them? I know that your mule or your wife's mule, Stacy, 28 years. Um, I rode her once and I didn't need spurs or anything like that. So kind of what are the scenarios where I'd want to do that? Okay. You were sitting, you weren't riding. Okay. I that stand corrected. This. That's okay. No problem. You were walking one in behind the other. It's not a big deal. When you're riding, that means you're riding with full communication. Mm -hmm. That means you're riding with your voice, hands, legs, and seat. Mm -hmm. That's riding. Setting one in behind the other, going down the trail, that's just setting. You're a passenger. All right. Now, got it. Let's, let's say I want to leave the riders and I want to go back off up a mountainside. So in order to do that, I'm going to have to communicate with my hands to point the direction. And then I'm going to use my legs to accelerate to say, this is where we're going to go. So I go to turn to the right. We start to go up a hill. I then use my legs, right, left, right side, go forward, left side, go forward. Then the mule should say, if the foundation is there, okay, we're going to go away from the herd. Now, at the same time, when I go, if I feel the mule kind of sucking back a little bit, not quite wanting to go forward, then I just, I just ask right, left. Now I'm going to tail with a little bit more emphasis in my legs, right, left, right, left. So I'm going to ask and tail. Then if I have to, I'm going to use my spur in demand. So I'm going to ask with my calf, tail with the side of my stirrup, demand with my spur to go forward. And of course, you're doing right, left, right, left to communicate with both sides of the mule because they don't have that cranial lobe that connects the right brain to the left brain. So you're telling them right, left, right, left so that they can understand it in their language, yes? You betcha, you betcha. And it's a whole lot easier on them than hitting them both at the same time. When people get bucked off or when the mule kicks back and stuff, that's when they harpoon them both at the same time. And that's, it's unfortunate, yeah. but that's what happens with the most people is they, they do both brains and the mule just gets caught off guard. It's yeah. too much information. Got it. Well, that's really helpful. And I think we did a good job explaining it because uh, uh, our friend who was the one who asked the question, Eileen, she says, that makes sense. So we did a good job of answering there. Eileen, if you do have any follow-ups, feel free to uh, to let us know. So I just want to get in here. Uh, we've got uh, several live questions that have come in. And so folks, we do give priority to the live questions. So if you have anything you want to ask, go ahead and put them in the comments section. Um, before I get to the next one, we've got uh, Carl McIntyre from uh, South Mississippi. Kevin Albright is joining us again. Uh, David Scholl from Queensland, uh, Australia is watching. Uh, Eileen says she's been working with mules and donkeys for four months. So good for you, Eileen. That's awesome. Yes. 
Yes. Let's see here. Gloria says, 12 years riding mules. Used to ride uh, AFA. AFA? Alf AFA. Oh. I'm not sure. Maybe Facebook might have cut off her tap. Ta uh, typing before she could get all the way to it. Um, let's see here. Oh, used to ride Arabians. That's what she said. Used ah, to ride okay. Arabians. American Arab Arabian Association. There we go. Debbie Olson yeah. says seven years loving mules. Um, Ryan Lockhart says five years with mules. And uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's awesome. Let's get to the next question. And this one is a live question that comes in from uh, uh, Karen. And she says, um, I've had my, uh, oh, let's see. No, she's just saying this is awesome. I've had my riding mule four years. She has taught me so much. Thanks for all the info you share every week. So we've got that. You're very welcome, Karen. So here we go. Gloria has with the trail bit, can they benefit from the mule riders martingale? Absolutely. Uh, that mule riders martingale, it does so many things. It looks complicated at first. People take it out and look at a box going, what am I going to do with this? But it refines your communication so nice. One of the downsides is people tend to want to hurry up and get to the end. And, but there has to be steps. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and on. H has to be steps to get there. Don't just put the bit in the mule's mouth and say, okay, I got the magic remedy. Here we go. It's my hands that tells the bit what to do. You can have the finest bit in the world just right. But if your hands don't communicate, you're up a creek. So going back to Martingale, absolutely. What the Martingale does is it makes your mule mentally and physically, it sets the mule up to win. So if the nose is on the vertical, what do I mean by win? If the nose is on the vertical and they're balanced from the top of their hip, top of the wither, top of their head, balanced across, how are they winning? That gets their back end up underneath them. It rounds out their back and makes them feel good. Ah, yes. Do I want my mule to feel good? Absolutely. But here's one of the problems. We're always holding on to the reins. And as we're holding on to them, their head's in the air. When the head's in the air, it hollows out their back. Do you feel good when your back's hurting? Yeah. So we go from a spine that's supposed to look like this. Now it looks like this because it's hollowed out. The Martingale, the Muretus Martingale frames them up, sets them up, and it's completely off of a string. You're riding on a string. Your reins hardly touch that bit unless they become a problem. Otherwise, it's a light touch that barely touches them on the, on the snaffle bit. And I use a double to wire tw snaffle bit because they respect it. Smooth snaffle bits, Dave. I tell you, one of these days I'm going to get a, uh, a picture of a mule's tongue that's cut by the nice smooth snaffle bit. Here's the problem. The smooth snaffle bit, people tend to pull yeah. harder and harder and harder. The horse people, especially the horse trainers, they're used to making one happen, and they try to pull on a mule, and a mule braces themselves trying to protect themselves. So the mule riding, riders, riders martingale is going to refine your communication. That's awesome. With the uh, one thing that I go back to when you start talking about the double twisted wire snaffle bit um, versus the smooth snaffle bit is when Denise from Michigan was out and yeah. she said, I just don't like that. It just looks it just looks nasty, you know, having having it the way that it is. And you said you said, OK, come on over here. Give me your finger. And so she put her finger out there. You took it and you made the adjustment. You feel that she goes, yeah. It's, it's not what you thought, was it? No. Then you took this the other one, uh, the smooth snaffle bit. Was it the smooth snaffle bit? And you yeah. adjust it. And she goes, "Oh, how?" And it's it's yeah. people don't know. They they judge the bit by its cover, when really you can't judge the bit by its cover. People are amazed when you demonstrate that double twisted wire snaffle bit. Yeah, yeah. I it's it's fun to pick uh, a little girl out of the audience, like 10 years old, 8, 10 years old, small and petite, you know, yeah. and I bring her over and I put the bit in her hand and I just barely move my hands and she responds. And then I take a big guy who, you know, is I, is an image of pulling on me. And when I go right, left, right, left, they let go of it. So yeah. it can be as it can be as nice as the mule wants to be or if the mule wants to be pretty dumb. You know, he wants to, to take advantage of you. Yeah. Then, by golly, you're going to win, you know. 
And the problem is this, Dave, is what people don't realize, even if they get just a snap a bit by himself, that mule can get a hold of that bit, throw his nose in the air, and he's got gotcha. you. He's got gotcha. you. And I've seen it hundreds of times. Yeah, that was a question that we actually had come in um, from Linda on Facebook, uh, and it was it was really right along those lines. He, she said, uh, I just bought your finished trail bit. I bought an older mule with a tough, possibly abused mouth. He was in a loose ring snaffle and was not listening well. I've switched yeah. to a hack soften a hack to soften his mouth and try to switch him neck rein. I would like to work with him into this bit, but wonder will I have more or less control than with the snaffle? And that's the response that we got back was the the uh, smooth snaffle bits don't work because the people over pull, which you had already talked about. Exactly. And uh, mechanical hackamore is a wonderful tool if the mule works 80% off his legs. You know, here's the abuse. You know, people say he's been abused in his mouth. The abuse is always holding on to the reins. They've always got them, you know. Let loose of them. Let it be relaxed. When the mule makes a mistake, fix it, forgive it, and go on. But here's, people think he's been abused because of overbidding and stuff. No, it's my hands that are the abuse. So one follow-up, um, and, and I think you've done a good job of explaining um, the Mule Riders Martingale, but uh, jo Josie from YouTube wrote in and just said, uh, why do mules need the Mule Riders Martingale for that refined communication? Is there no way to get them to relax enough to lower their heads? So do you want to just speak to that last little part there? Is there no way to get them to relax enough to lower their heads? If you have the abilities to feel it, Yes, but here's the downside. Most folks don't have that feel. And besides that, when they have the reins, it goes direct to the bit. So you're already heavy. The Mule Riders Martingale has a string on it, a small string that communicates to that bit, not your reins. So it gives the animal a chance to relax. The problem is the constant weight and your constant hands on that bit, it's difficult for them to relax. So, yes, you would take your hands and go right, left, right, left, and the head will come down. But when you go riding along, all of a sudden you don't feel it, and pretty soon the head's in the air. The Mule Riders Martingale, with that string, automatically communicates to that mule, get your nose on a vertical, get your head down, with a light touch, way lighter than your hands can be. That's awesome. Thank you for clearing that up. I appreciate that. I'll be I'll be very happy to put that together into a small clip. So as people are looking for, you know, how do I get that communication? How do I get that refined communication? We can do that. Go for it. Yeah, but here's the deal, Dave. It, do we do we have anything on YouTube showing the mule riders Martin Gale and that black mule going around? You know what? I'd have to double check. I I don't think I can't recall offhand, but we can we can we certainly do. locate it. Thing. You all want proof? Watch the video of the mule going around. Nobody's on his back. It's strictly the martingale and the bit doing the job. Watch the mule go from his head in the air, watching his head come down and nose on the vertical. Now, that video uh, goes with my mule rider's martingale, so people learn how to do it. Dave, I don't know of anybody out there that sends a video with the bit with the Mule Riders Martingale saying, this is how you use it, you know? And you can see there's nobody on this mule's back, and you can see this mule responding, head coming down, nose coming on the vertical, nobody on his back, and that should be enough proof to say the bit works. Is it, the, is it a video with, uh, with the gentleman? We also have a video where it's talking about preparing to mount. No, no, actually, it's the one, it's the Mule Riders Martingale video. Oh, it's that actual video. Okay, I'll actual locate video. it. We'll get that up on YouTube. We'll link it so people can check it out and see what it is you're talking about. Yeah, and they can actually see it then because it's, it, there's the proof, all right? If with the, with the nobody on his back, that Mule Riders Martingale sets that mule up. Now, we've got a lot of other videos on the, uh, on the correctional mouthpiece, the trail rider, but, I have to really go back and look and see if you can see. I don't think I have one just a bit in the mouth with nobody on his back. That might be That'd something be we'll have to do. do yeah. 
Great. Well, uh, real quick follow-up question from the, uh, from the uh, spur question. Kevin asks, how long do you wait before you start riding with spurs on a green broke mule? I, it depends on the mule. It depends on how sensitive the mule is. If, and, and again, my groundwork. Understand, I start out with a quirk touching the side because it's really easy to get kicked when they get worried. You got to remember all mules bite, all mules buck, all mules kick, all mules bite you know, and run off all that. So I pretty much depends on how sensitive the mule is. If the mule gives to my leg pretty readily, I could be six months down the road. Remember, all foundational training is six months. So it really depends on how sensitive the mule is. If the mule is responding to your legs, you know, right, left, right, left, then just keep on going. It's when they start getting dull to it, or if they're already kind of dull sided, then you might can use it then. Very good. Hopefully that helps there, Kevin. Uh, so folks, as you're watching, if you have any questions, any follow-up questions like Kevin did, go ahead and put those in the comment section. These videos, we're, we're here doing this for you guys. Steve already knows this stuff, but one of the huge values that he has is to <laughs> share it and to make sure that it outlives him, to make sure that he gets yes. this information in the hands of you guys so that you can continue to, to you know, grow the equine community and help them understand how to really serve love, care for, and use mules and donkeys so that there is a mutual benefit right there so that the so that the mule and the donkey serves our purposes, but at the same time, they have the most enjoyment and they have the, the greatest ease as possible. So let's keep moving here. Uh, we've got Ray Lockert says, oh, he asked why you bump right, left, right, left. We talked about that. Randolph Reed says, headed to mountains of North Carolina to try out my new saddle and pad. Watching your video tonight. We're, we're happy to ha have you here, Randolph. Yes. Let's see here. Uh, Susan says she's finally on. Glad to have you, Susan. Um, Ryan Lockhart gives a great follow-up question then. He says, why is it important for the mule to have his head down and nose vertical? You talked about it, but just speak specifically to that, Steve, so he, he okay. hears you. Okay, it's important to have the head down because what that does is it gets the back end up underneath the mule where he's driving off his hindquarters, and that rounds out his back so his spine is correct. The problem we have, uh, Ray, is that most of the time people are holding on to the reins, thinking they have to hold on to the steering wheel, for instance, hold on to the reins. That elevates their head. When that happens, that hollows out the back. And when that happens, the back goes from being like this to like this. And now we have a, a spine that's only touching half when it should be hitting flush. It's imperative when the no that the head is down. Now, when the nose is on the vertical, that means they respect the bit and they're responding to it. When the nose is sticking out, that means that they don't have respect to the bit and they're trying to control it. Perfect. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of uh, uh, clarity there, Ray. So I've got a really cool story from Yolanda. She just sent this in. She says, Steve, I have something to tell you. I have big news. And so I wrote back. I said, tell us. She says, okay. About a month ago, I was asked for an interview in the magazine for the Spanish Horses Netherlands, and the magazine is called Pura Passion. Uh, Pura Passion. Uh, the interview was how I got my mule and why a Spanish mule. So I told them, and I also told them that I got in contact with Steve and that he helped me out, and guess what? His name is mentioned. Steve Edwards from Queen Valley Mule Ranch. I never thought they would put his name in the magazine, so his name is now known in the Spanish horse world out here in the Netherlands. How cool is that? Hey, that's awesome. I, You know, Dave, we was talking about earlier, you know, trying to be able to use this in, in the future. You know, the old guys I learned from, Nick West, you know, uh, DeLos Burke, uh, Bud Brown, those guys are gone. And with them is years of knowledge. So this is awesome where I can help folks they can take this knowledge and go on. I love it when people tell me they went over and a person was having a hard time loading a mule. They put the come along hitch in, the mule jumped right in. Boy, Nick West would get a big smile out of his face when he would hear something like that. You know? Yeah, it is just awesome. I, I we, we were talking a little bit before. Uh, this is one of those things that just makes us smile. Uh, Joy sent in a, just a message. We had been chatting back and forth with Joy over Facebook Messenger. She says, I just want to tell you how much 
Uh, I and my mule love the saddle that came in time for f- my five-day camping trip. My mule used to cow kick and flinch on his right side after the first day of a long ride. No longer doing it. Wish I wow. had gotten your saddle a couple of years ago when he was broken. Thanks a lot for your help. And it's just one of those things where it's not about the saddle. It's about the mule. It's about the education. Yes. It, the saddle yes. is just a tool, but it's hearing here that somebody who – experienced frustration is no longer experienced frustration and a mule that was experienced in pain is comfortable. Yeah. And, you know, and David, I, and, and you, you know how, how I feel about trying to quote sell things I rather, do. Than, I do. rather than helping people out, but it's so detrimental and so important to the animal. Uh, I had a, a, a friend of mine contact me and said that uh, when they went to a, to an expo here the other day, they were saying how they, how they enjoyed this trainer in his training, and he did a good job. And that they had, one of their complaints about me is that I was trying to sell stuff. Well, what they didn't hear from this trainer, they only heard the training aspect. They didn't mm-hmm. hear about the comfort aspect of the mule. Yeah, you know, you know, that's the first thing I do, Dave. When when people are coming to me for training, first thing I want to know is. Let's make the mule comfortable. Let's yeah. adjust the bit. Yes. Let's set up a saddle, you know, and, and, and let's get that done first. But unfortunately, uh, the, this trainer went right into training and she was saying my, this, this uh, client of mine was saying, you know, he did a nice job, a great job of training and helping the people, but she could see that the mule was uncomfortable because the saddle was sitting on top of the scapula. Yeah, the bit, the bit, the mule's head was really high and the guy didn't do anything to do, didn't have anything to do with helping the mule. It was more interested in in this person, so-called. Well, and he was training. But what about the mule? Come on. You know? Yep, absolutely. We've got a couple more questions. Uh, Let's see. Karen uh, Heatwall says our mule keeps putting his tongue above the bit on the mule rider's martingale. This mule has been ridden in a joint, uh, jointed bit with shanks before we bought it. What are we doing wrong? What do you have to say to Karen there? Okay, number one, uh, make sure that your dental work is squared away, that you have the wolf teeth pulled on the mule and that his mouth is correct. Always get the mechanical done first. Second thing, uh, is it a John mule or, or a Molly mule? So, Karen, that's a great question. Are we talking about a John mule or a Molly mule uh, when we're talking about this uh, issue of putting the tongue um, above the bit? Is it a John mule or a Molly mule? So now let's look at this. Here's the mouth. Here's incisors. That's the front teeth. If it's a John mule, he's going to have a canine right here. All right. If it's a Molly mule, he's not going to have the canine. So what you want to do is usually what happens when the mules Gets his tongue over the bit, which is no John big deal. Nope. It's a John mule. John mule, so so it's going to be bumping a canine. So as the bit is hanging down, bumping on that canine is going to make him uncomfortable. He's going to pick it up, put it down, pick it up, put it down. If he gets his tongue over top of it, that's okay, because here's what happens. Pretty soon, the bars of his mouth will start getting a little tender, and the mule ain't no dummy. He's going to put his tongue back underneath there to protect his bars. Okay, so number one, get the mechanical squared away. Make sure the dentist has seen his teeth. Got that all squared away. Make sure the wolf teeth are pulled up on top. That's two things. All right. And then the next part is give the mule time. If this mule, uh, how old's the mule? So another great question there uh, for you, Karen, is how old is the mule? How would you break that up? Is there is there a young middle-aged and old, or is it just no, all across the board? It's all across the board. Here's the thing. If the mule is 10 years old, we can't expect this mule to have this thing in just a few hours. He's got ten year, or at least eight years of dinking around. Okay. What about so, four years? Three years? Four years is what she says. Four years. Okay. So just a baby. So the other thing is to, when it comes down to the four-year-olds, they, they are also, they're teething. They teeth all the way until they're seven. So if he's teething, you know, it, you're going to have to wait it out as well. A young mule. Your older mules, you're seven years old and older. They'll pick it up quicker and have it. But the big thing is, are you letting a bit hang down, bumping 
the the canine. And if so, then just give him time. He'll pick it up and he'll carry it. Don't get in a hurry to ride. When they get quiet in the mouth, make note of that. Pull the bridle off. Put it back on the next day or a few days later. They'll pick it up even quicker. But the split second, they get quiet, take it off. Give them a break. Let them, let them say, oh boy, that's good. Then a few days later, slide it back in there again. But don't just put it in there and expect the mule to, to work right away. You know, he's going to have to ask questions about it. If he gets his tongue over top of the bit, it's not a big deal. Make sure though, if he gets his tongue over top of the bit, that the bit is hanging down. If you, if you're creating one wrinkle or two wrinkles, then yeah, he's telling you, Hey, that bit's too high up in my mouth. That's good. So uh, when it rains, it pours. And we've got all sorts of questions about bits coming in. Um, uh, you may have answered this, but I've got to ask it because I, honestly, I just don't know enough to know if you've addressed this specifically in some of the answers you've already given. Uh, Anna Curry says, hi, I can't stay because of class, but she made sure to get in and ask her questions. She says, what kind of bit do you recommend for a driving mule pull contest to have communication on the driving lines? Thanks. Okay, so if we're talking pulling contest, then all we're going to do is we're hooking the mules up and we go a few yards. That's it. Okay. In that case, I want to use a snaffle bit, period. Now, if I am driving and my mule is, is a finished mule, in other words, I barely have to touch the bit, I'm going to use a liver pull bit. If I am building a foundation, the snaffle bit that I talked about is going to be a full cheek, double twisted wire. Why is that? The full cheek goes on both sides of the mouth and helps with the communication right and left. That's mainly because when I drive or when I ride, I ride with the bit hanging down, bumping the teeth. The incisors on a molly. The canine on a John. All right. Now, so when I have long lines from driving, that means I'm going to have more leverage and more communication. So therefore, if my bit is hanging loose in the mouth, if I over pull, I pull the bit through the mouth. So that's why I use the full cheek bit so that, that it doesn't pull through their mouth and gives you that communication inside the face. So, Full cheek, double twisted wire for building a foundation or for this pulling like we're talking about. It's a contest, Dave, as they, they put a bunch of weight on a sled and they can see which team of meals pulls it the farthest. So if that's what she's doing, that's fine. So a liver pull bit for finish, double twisted wire, full cheek for training. Awesome. I uh, hope, hope that helps, Anna. And Anna, as, as you're watching this, if you have any follow-up questions, send us a message on Facebook and we'll be sure to uh, take care of it. We have uh, Gloria Meyer just chiming in on the Mule Riders Martingale. She says, we have used the Mule Riders Martingale for two months now on Rosie. Big difference. The mule now works off two fingers. Very light, head down, face on the vertical, very slow trot, very smooth. And that's what you want. That's right. That's right. So now we got to think now we got a six month foundation of using that. Don't quit. Keep up with six months with that. Now, four to six hours a week. Now, in three months and she's getting there. OK, she's getting there in three months. If she can one handed stop, turn right, left and everything within a 10 foot circle, we can start introducing the trail rider bit. Now, look, it's. It's going to be different with every mule. Some mules get a little bit more depth and they ask more questions. Other mules just say, ah, that's what it is. Zap, they got it. Don't put them all in the pail and say every mule does this. Don't do that. Awesome. So uh, let's see. Susan says, uh, my new saddle is so comfortable. Does your saddle maker make horse saddles? So uh, is there is that <laughs> what, what would you have to say there? Well, you know, Susan, I I. I my saddle maker does lower his standards. Ha ha. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, we can have you a saddle made on, on, on semi quarter horse bars. And, uh, and I appreciate you saying it's comfortable. You must be setting the saddle correctly. A lot of people say when they're, they say the saddle's uncomfortable, 
they're not setting correctly in the saddle. That's usually the problem. So, yes, we can have a saddle made for you, for the horse. Uh, we have uh, we have bars that work really good. They're, again, that come off of my pack saddle, but we can help you out. If you want to call me, I'll personally take the order, and I'll personally have that saddle made uh, custom the way you want it. Awesome. Glad to hear that. So let's see here. Next question we have is uh, Sherman Johnson, uh, Norman, Oklahoma. I have a three-year-old, uh, have a come-along hitch on her, but she's a real gun shy around the, a pad and saddle. She starts breathing hard and tries to pull the rope out of my hand when I try to put the pad on her. She has white spots on her from previous owner. Do I need to just take my time with her and keep working with the come-along rope? That's a great question. Great question. Okay, let's go back again. Remember the mechanical. How comfortable is the animal? If there's white spots on that animal, she's not been very comfortable. All right? So go get the chiropractor. Make sure the back is in place right. Shoulders, hips are right. Look, folks, just because I say chiropractor, don't just think spine. Because a lot of times what happens, shoulders can be out, hips can be out. And then the other part is, you know, the teeth. Get the teeth loaded. Folks, get the mechanical, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> get the mechanical squared away first. Yes, the come along hitch tells the feet to stand still. But if you're seeing big white spots, uh, folks, that's not good. All right? That's not good. Somebody's using the wrong saddle. They're not using the breaching. They're not tightening up the back cinch. All of the above. Yeah. Uh, next question comes in and, and this one is kind of in this theme of what we've been talking about. Steve, if you're saying that mules and donkeys care more about their nose than they do about their mouth, then why don't you use a bit with a nose band? You talk about double twisted snaffle during early training, but that doesn't communicate to the nose. I might be missing when, when to, and when not to. And that question comes from Jason on Facebook. And I think that's a great question. It makes sense. Why yeah. wouldn't you use something on their nose when you're trying to communicate if that's what they care about? Let's hear what you have to say. Because it's too much information. Since mm. they care about their nose, most bits that use the nose communication and the mouth communication are gag bits. All right. And the problem is if we're using the nose and the mouth, we're throwing too much pressure at one time upon the animal. Use one or the other, okay? If the mule works 80% off your legs, use a mechanical hack more at times. If he's, if he's not using, if he's not working 80% off your legs, use your bits and stuff and work your way into mechanical hack more. But never are you going to be happy with the end result of communication of nose and mouth and chin. The people who come to me with runaway problems, or animals that won't stop are using that type of bits, okay? Uh, and and some of them are even still across the nose. It can be horrible. So I never suggest using a bit that uses nose, mouth, and underneath the chin. Either use one or the other. Great. Next question. Uh, this is from David, and uh, David was watching on YouTube. Folks, we love comments on YouTube. When you go over to YouTube, leave comments and uh, subscribe to the channel. That is just gangbusters for us. That allows us to continue to put more videos up on YouTube. So I uh, yeah. really appreciate David from YouTube taking the time to leave a comment. And uh, and he has a question that uh, I was curious about. He says, you said the saddle has a polypropylene tree. Did you mean a Ralladay tree? I have made heaps of saddles on these trees, but what interests me is you say your rope of this tree, uh, what model tree is it? Thank you. So. I was looking at that, and and most what are most saddles made off of? What type of a tree? Well, they're all made off of some type of plastic. You know, okay. he's talking about Rawlide. That's a company. They make trees. Oh. They make. They even make furniture parts and things like this. They do molds. Okay, so uh, uh, I my tree is is I don't share with anybody where my tree's made or anything. There's nothing on my saddle that tells you about the tree. The tree is strictly mine. I do not share it. I do not sell it. I don't tell anybody where it's made or anything like that. So, uh, and by the way, I use both. Uh, I use uh, both my uh, my plastic tree and my wood tree. I have a wood tree for the traditionalists. Uh, a lot of working cowboys that are traditionalists, they, wanna, they want wood. 
I I personally like my plastic uh, tree. I try to be updated on all of my um, uh, on all of my training and this sort of thing. And I, this uh, this plastic tree is absolutely incredible. And uh, I'm using the word polypropylene. Uh, David's uh, not really polypropylene, but I use it because I don't want folks to know how we make these trees. Period. Yep, it's one hey, of those. It's one of those yeah, deals where yeah, a Steve yeah, Edwards hey, saddle is a Steve yeah. Edwards saddle. Period. That's right. That's it. You know, I you know, a lot of people would like to know, and I'm sure there's already been. I'm sure people that have taken apart my saddles to see what kind of tree it is, yada yada. But it's not just the tree. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's just like semi quarter horse. There are a lot of companies that make semi quarter horse. There are a lot of companies that make full quarter horse and they're all a little bit different. You know, the, what I use is strictly my stuff, period. Well, I appreciate you giving that answer and I'm sure that the people watching appreciate you giving that answer too, because what we're doing is we're trying to do exactly what the mule needs. We're not trying to get in here, make a dollar, things like that, of course. You know, there, there's that side of it where we got to make sure that we're turning turning money so that we can keep showing up. But that's not the reason. The reason we're coming back to it is there's the instruction part, and a lot of people get the instruction part, but they miss the comfort part. They miss the caring about the animals, and that's the distinction and the gap that we're trying to bridge here. And so I appreciate you taking the time to share it. We've got Haley Williams just timed on, and Haley goes, "Hey, Steve, we watch you on YouTube." And that's one thing you say. Almost everybody that you talk to says that they see you on YouTube. Isn't that a, isn't that right? Yeah, it is, Dave. Uh, you know, I've been trying all kinds of ways over the years to share with people a different way of training, and and I hope I I, I know a lot of people have seen it. You know, uh, and this YouTube has been a, just a great way for people to hear it and to see it. You know, and of course I'm going to have the naysayers. You know. Their, their training is the best training in the world and good for them. You know, if it works for you, use it. If I don't work for you, turn me off, go to somebody else, you know, but you know, if I'm helpful to you, please let us know. And of course, we're going to have the negatives. That's okay. You know, sometimes you got to beat people down to get up on top. Uh, I understand maybe your way of thinking, but my way of thinking is, is it best for the mule? Am I helping you out? That's what I'm going to do. Uh, I've been doing this for, for over 40 years and to, to think that I can, I can touch so many people all over yeah, the world yeah. with YouTube and Instagram. That's what I want to do, Dave. Yeah, that's, that's it's that. something yeah. else. Well, you know, yeah. one, one person who's been just a great encouragement, uh, who's been a, just a fantastic support, uh, who's been just a stellar client, uh, Gloria Meyer. And she's got I another know. question here. She says, yeah. what do you recommend as a curb chain? What do you recommend as a curb chain or a strap? So, First, okay. I need to know what are we talking about, and then can you answer her question? Boy, I wish I had a bit in front of me here right now. Okay, so a curb chain is on a finished bit. So the bridle comes down and and snaps into what's called the pitch. That's the top part of the bit. Then the lower part is the shank, and the bit itself is in the mouth. So a curb chain touches the the nerves on the chin. There's a lot of really refined nerves here and barely touching it makes a mega difference. Unfortunately, a lot of people like using chains on these uh, mules and donkeys to make them stand still. They kill all this. You'll see a lot of packers use chains on their halters. They're killing these nerves. That don't need to be. As you all know, my rope halter is different. So curb chain, what it amounts to is when we pick up on the bit, that bit first rolls in the mouth, then the curb chain comes up and tells the mule to stop. Okay, now I use a double chain because uh, it's big and flat to start with on my mules. I have it two fingers from the bottom of the chin to my curb chain. Now, as I refine, and I do want to get better. I use a single curb chain because by then the single curb chain will be like the spur just touching. So the single curb chain will now start just starting to touch and communicate, respond to the whoa or the backup. And then finally, if I've got one really good and he's being consistent, 
I'll take and, and make a, a curb chain out of rawhide or I'll use a leather uh, uh, curb chain. But that's the purpose of the curb chain is to be able to communicate a backup or a whoa. Very good. I hope that helps you out there, Gloria. We love having you here. Love hearing from you. Love helping you. It's uh, Knife's it's, on the way. What's that? The, her knife's on the way. Knife is on the way, Gloria. You heard it straight from the source there. So a couple questions here before we uh, before we close out this week, Steve. Um, I think it was one of our first or second broadcasts. We talked about white lines disease, and I had a question come in from uh, Michelle on Facebook. And Michelle says, hi from Tennessee. Hi, Michelle. Um, I'm with my farrier right now, and apparently all this rain has made my mule's front feet so soft that his feet are starting to uh, look to what looks like come apart. What can I do to get him over what looks like the start of white line disease? I've never seen anything like it. I am so worried. Well, it's probably a white powder looking. And how much smell does it have? Does it have a really nasty smell? Okay. So what can I do first? First of all, I get the mule in a dry paddock as soon as possible. The problem is, is it's not just the mud. It's all of the bacteria that's in the mud. And that's, that is where we have a problem. I, you know, you come out to my ranch, you see all of my mules are standing on granite. It's uh, it's quarter minus granite. And the nice thing about the granite, the water runs off really quick. Any place your mule is going to be standing for any length of time, you want to have it so it high and, it's high and dry. It's the urine and it's the manure and it's the it's the germ can, content that's there. It's not so much the wetness, but the wetness then turns around and and unfortunately magnifies the situation. So dry spot, number one, uh, you know, if it's white and powdery, it's probably, uh, it's probably not white lines disease by any means. White lines disease, uh, there really all the professionals, including myself, I, I don't really have an answer. Nobody really has it, why it starts or anything like that. But the best thing you can do is keep your meals high and dry. That's the best thing you can do. Awesome. So we'll and bleach. Hope, oh, go ahead. What were you, what'd you say? Go ahead. Pardon me. I like to use bleach. The problem is, is in the sole is where you start seeing this white powdery come in. And again, uh, there's lots of different products that work pretty decent. I use the old ways of using bleach uh, at the, you know, if it comes down to it, you're sure can put a pad on it and could and can put uh, pine tar linseed oil in there to be able to help keep it dry but uh it it's it's a battle folks uh it's a it's a severe battle yeah it's not we've talked about it several times and it's always one of those conversations that you know it, it's it's relevant but it's not one that we you know like to talk about especially because like you said like no one's really got a great solution for it um well we will uh we'll end uh with two questions um hopefully this one will be quick uh susan uh from facebook says does anyone have the name of an exceptional equine chiropractor in arizona that would travel to kingman my new mule had an awful unbalanced feet and i suspected a bad saddle fit he is bendy to the left totally stiff to the right i really want to get him adjusted any uh any advice there steve any comments Ah, uh, man, I, I, we, you got a great dentist there in uh, Kingman, but I don't know of, uh, of a chiropractor. Only chiropractors I know of are down here in, uh, in, in uh, the valley. And I don't know if they leave and go anywhere, but I, I do have uh, a couple here that really do a nice job. Uh, I've got a friend of mine that's a veterinarian up in Payson that, um, uh, originally turned me on to these people but folks you may have to travel if you're going to get it done and 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 here's the thing Sue. that's susan callahan she has a couple of my saddles she has some beautiful mules she's also a sheriff up there and thanks for your service to us uh susan as well um uh, but anyway going back to this susan uh, it, it it'll be worth the travel to do it because if your mule is not wanting to turn and is keeping its leg down trying to make the turn you most likely have a shoulder out, and it's usually the opposite shoulder. 
if he's having a hard time turning to the right, it's probably the left shoulder that's out, you know. Very good. So last question. This one you and I just talked about right before uh, right before we went live, and you said that's a great one. Just add that to the list. Um, and it's not a great one because of what happened, but it's great yeah. to talk about. Um, so this one comes from Kristen from Facebook, and she sent two messages, so I'm going to read both of them. There was a little bit of time separating both of them. The first one is having problems with my mule. To recap, she's two, and I've had her for a month, been just taking things slow and brushing and such. She offered to kick when I go to pick up her left front foot, so I started just teaching her the give me your foot cue with the scapula. I was working with her today. So this is the second message, a little bit of time separating. I was working with her today, and I was able to pick the foot up twice, and the second time I noticed a possible large scar on the pastern of the leg. I went to pick it up again to look further, and she kicked me with her hind foot. Got mm. me in the brow and the nose. Not too bad, but obviously... This is a problem. What yeah. what do we need to tell Kristen and anybody else out there that finds themselves in a similar scenario? And I think it, first and foremost, this is not a safe thing. Working with equine is no. never safe. There's there's no. no way you can. We were doing. We were at the clinic, and you said everybody go ahead and find yourself a safe spot. Not that that actually exists. So this mm. is a dangerous thing, and we have to say that we have to make that clear. But Within that, we can take precautions. What would you say to Kristen and anyone that is in that position? Okay, number one, Kristen, uh, old Tom Dorrance, uh, who is the who is super known for his, he's passed away now, told me a long time ago. He said, Steve, I had a mule tell me not to pick that foot up, and I still have the use of my nose. And and it's really, folks, you're in a vulnerable vulnerable position when you bend over like that. You got that mule can kick you with ease. They can kick you standing at their nose. They can still kick you. So the number one thing is the key word you said, you picked up the foot. Don't pick up the foot. Let them hand you that foot. When you push that button, they pick it up and they hand it to you. In other words, they hold it up. If you have to touch that foot, you have not done your homework. You've not done the foundational training. So we touch the, the scapula and we tap it with the with the uh, with a stick, uh, you know, or some type of quirk. We tap it. The mule, because he's uncomfortable, will pick it up and hold it for you. I was too bad Stacy ain't still around where you can see it. You know, you push that button, any foot, you pick it up, they pick it up and they hold it and they hold it up for you. If you got to reach down and put on that foot. You're asking to be kicked. They're going to kick at you, you know, mainly because flight and fright. Every mule, every mule bites, kicks, kicks. Hear that? Kicks, runs off, bucks. They all do it. I've been kicked harder by horses because they just blurt it out. A mule tends to just kind of give you a tap. And he gave you a love tap. You're lucky you still got a head on. OK, so let's go back to this. Dave. The video that you had on our on our last Tuesday mm -hmm. get together, and you said, "Hey, wait till you see this." Yeah, and I I, I knew what you were going to do. It was the come along with a back foot. Yep. All right. Incredible. And, and, yeah. And so, folks, I cannot tell you enough. Use the come along hitch. You got bedding problems, picking up feet problems. Your halter is not going to do the job. That come along hitch is going to tell that mule, don't do that. And when you and and in that video, I, I, I like to see the video. Of course, I was there doing it, but he's going to watch the video, you know. But that mule turn was perfectly still, wasn't he, Dave? Yep. And I picked up that back foot, and before he pulled on me and dinked around and stuff. And when I put that come along hitch on, that was the end of it. Period. Okay. You always got a chance of getting bit or kicked or run over folks these are flight because of fright animals you know and i don't care if they're 35 years old or three and a half months kicking is part of a mule's life it's part of an equine's life mules donkeys horses so go back and do the foundational training uh you never pull on a foot never touch it until they pick it up and hold it when they pick it up and hold it that means they're standing on all three feet. That means they know they're not to move. Come along, hitch said not to move. 
and they won't move. So what I'm doing right now is I'm actually putting a link in the comment section below this video to last week's special stream. And of course, if you did, if you guys weren't here last week watching with us, Steve wasn't here either. It was just me flying solo because I don't really know what I'm talking about. I just know how to ask the questions. I went ahead and I took a whole bunch of my favorite clips and some of the more popular clips that we've had from YouTube, Facebook live stream, um, and then from the clinics that we've recently done, I put them together. I'm going to put a link down below to last week's stream. You go back, watch the whole thing. It's fantastic. But at the 47 minute mark is where we show the video footage that Steve is talking about, where he takes about eight to 10 minutes to get this horse using the come along hitch. Mule. That mule. Golly. Sorry. I didn't mean to offend anybody to <laughs> take this mule and get this mule to give the back leg. She didn't want to give the back leg at all. And Steve yeah. methodically step by step went through and it's just amazing to go through and watch. So I'm going to put that in the link below. Steve, that's all that we've got. I do want to just acknowledge that uh, Jason Brown was here. Jason's been fantastic asking questions through Facebook. And uh, yeah. he says, Steve looks refreshed. Are you refreshed, Steve? Oh, man, when I go hunting, I'm refreshed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kristen uh, says that she was actually watching. So the, the gal who we were just talking about, she says, I'm, I'm here. I'm watching. She says, amen. Uh, she says she has an old in. Oh, here. She has an old injury. This, this uh, mule has an old injury. Will she get over this? Yes. There you go. There yes. you go, Kristen. Let's see. Uh, <laughs> Haley Williams says, thanks so much, Steve, for doing what you do. Jason Brown says, you did awesome. Uh, oh, he was probably talking to me that I, I did awesome. Well, I'm, I'm, carrying, <laughs> I'm carrying it okay there then. Uh, this is another great live stream from Eileen Easterday. Uh, Gloria says, you did great last week, Dave. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. This is a lot of fun for me too. So looking forward to, uh, to the order coming to me this week. That's right. Eileen, Eileen is fantastic. She's been in this for four months. She's been on just about every stream that we've had. She's just learning and learning and learning. Yep. And, um, and she's, uh, she's gone, she's gotten her tack, she's gotten her equipment. I think she got herself a saddle. So she's in this yep. thing. And Eileen, we are just ecstatic to be in this with you. So please yep. uh, continue to let us know how we can help, what questions I can bring up to Steve and, uh, and we're here for you uh, and other people who find themselves in the exact same position. We want you to enjoy this thing, not give up on that mule, not give up on that donkey and realize that, uh, that it is possible to have this, uh, this partnership, this relationship uh, with the animal that so many people want. So, Steve, yep. thanks so much for hanging out. We will uh, yep. we'll see you next week. Sound good? Yep. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in Minnesota cold. Come on down to the uh, the Minnesota Horse Fair, and let's spend some time together. Let's talk mules and donkeys. Awesome. We'll see you then. Take care. See ya.